on Wednesday nights right now, we're doing a series on the subject of faith. And I know it's sort of like an old school series and message. I, I totally get it and understand it that some people are coming out and they're like, man, I've never heard this before. Other people are like, I've heard this before. Either way, let me just tell you, we need to hear it over and over again. So Jesus made it very clear that we live this life and it is a faith life. It's a faith walk. Paul the apostle came along. He made it very clear. This life that we live now as Christ followers is a faith walk. So here's what we've done so far. In week number one, um, if you were here, we started talking about just what, what is faith? You know, when you think about the subject of faith, it's, it's a big subject. Tons and tons of scriptures in the Bible about it. Over 500 uh, verses in the Bible on the subject of faith. So when you start thinking about that, there's no way in a series you can cover them all. Um, so there's so many you could teach on it for years and years and years. But we're just, we're just doing one series right now, just sort of spark our faith and, and get us into the direction that we believe that God wants us to go in. In week number two, we've talked about the location of faith. Faith is found in your heart. And um, I think that's important. I think most of you know that uh, faith is not found in your head. I love what we talked about when we taught on this. And that's this, that you can have doubt in your head, but still have faith in your heart. In other words, your mind doesn't have anything to do with your faith walk. Now, it can mess you up if you leave it there long enough. You need to renew your mind. But even if there are times you're doubting in your mind, faith is found in the heart and faith works out of the heart. And so we talked about that. And, and uh, last week when we uh, met, we talked about how faith comes. And I think that's important. If you, if you were not here, I, I think you should hear that. Um, faith comes, according to the scriptures, by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we, we have a lot of things we can be hearing out in this land that we live in called the world, you know, the, the, the country we live in, all kind of stuff that is going on that we can hear. But faith only comes by hearing the word. Faith doesn't come by other ways. So that doesn't mean you have to be in the Bible 24-7, but it does mean that the word of God is the only thing that will produce faith in your heart. Nothing else will produce it. Amen. I mean, you can listen to good teaching, all that kind of stuff, but um, the thing that's going to really produce faith in your heart is God's word. So here's what we're going to talk about tonight. We're going to talk about um, releasing faith and how to release faith into your situations of life. Now, I want to just ask you a question real quick. How many people here have at least one situation that's going on in your life that you need to release faith into? Any, anyone at all? So some. Just kidding. Everybody. Um, if you didn't raise your hand, you know you can. You, you, know, you know it's true. All of us are going through. I'm going through some stuff that I'm releasing faith currently into, and I'm sure you're doing the same thing. And when you hear that, the question would be, what do you mean releasing faith into a situation? Well, here's the thing. If faith just stays in your heart, that means it's never released. So you can have faith in your heart, and you can be meditating on scriptures and reading scriptures, but are you going to release it into the situation that you're going through? And if you're hearing like, I don't, I don't know what that means. What, what do you mean into the situation? I mean into a body that's sick. Are you all with me? Finances that are going down the wrong road. Are you going to release faith into those situations? Are you going to just stare at them and not do anything? Because a lot of us just stare at them and we're like, well, I'm not going to open my mouth. I don't know if I say something, maybe the devil's going to even get worse, you know, or whatever. No, the only way anything changes is you releasing faith into the situation that you're currently in. God wants you to do that. God will not be mad at you for doing that. In fact, God wants you to release faith into the situation that you're currently going through. So we're going to talk about how to do that. Before we do, I wanted to just this is not on the screen, so if you want to jot it down, you can. But I heard a friend say this, and I thought, man, that's really good. Um, they said this. They said, keep filling yourself up with God's word through your ears, and eventually it will come out your mouth. Keep filling up your life, your heart, with the word of God through your ears. It's the only way it comes in. And eventually it's going to come out of your mouth. And I think that's such a, such a vital thing. I think it's interesting and uh, I believe it's Matthew chapter six. And let me just check. Yeah, verse 31. Jesus said this. He said, take no thought in saying, what will we eat? What will we drink? And how are we going to get clothes put on our body? 
Jesus said, don't take no thought. So it's interesting. It's sort of the opposite of what I just said. Jesus said, if you have the wrong thoughts going on in your mind and you start saying what your thoughts are, it's going to get you in trouble. Jesus said, don't take any thought by saying. You know, sometimes we think about things and then we say it. And the next thing we know, we're saying things that are keeping us back instead of moving us forward. I know that might just be me that needs to hear that, but, um, or the four people clapping, but I guarantee you that if you'll examine your life, there are times you're not moving forward in the things that God wants you to move forward into because things are coming out of your mouth that you're thinking on. Listen, you can think on some stuff that you don't ever want to say, right? So even though thoughts come, you just don't speak them out because when you start saying certain things, it will hold you back from what God's best is in your life. So uh, here's the definition of faith. If you want to write it down, if you haven't yet, this is strictly from like, if you go to a Greek concordance and look up the word faith, these, these are some of the things you're going to find out about what is faith. Faith is this. Faith is what you believe. It's pretty simple. So, you know, we say we have faith. It's what I believe. It's my conviction, what I'm convicted of, and it's what I'm convinced of. So faith, it's pretty basic, right? It's what I believe. So if I believe Jesus is my healer, I have faith. If I believe that Jesus could meet all of my needs because the scripture says he will, the Bible says he'll supply all of our needs, then he will. And that's having faith in what God says. So we made this statement, just trying to go over a couple things real quickly. Um, We made this statement that faith needs to be fed and faith needs to be exercised. Faith needs to be fed. Faith needs to be used. That's a different way of saying it. So tonight, what we're really going to talk about is how you start to use it or how you start to exercise it. That's really what we're going to talk about. And think about this. Just think about it just in the natural. Most people don't want to talk about exercise. Right? I mean, most people don't want to do it. Now, it's interesting because I know there are certain people in our church. Some of them are trainers. Some of them work out like a lot. So they know that I do, so they'll, they'll always talk to me about it. And I, I could, if, if, you, if any of them have ever done it, they know. I'll talk for an hour or two about it. Why? Because I, I do it, and I understand it, and I like it, so I talk about it. Are you all with me? But when you talk about exercising faith, it's almost like people shut down as soon as you're like, oh, I have to do something? And this is, why, this is what I think confuses people. Grace is everything God did for you. Faith is something completely different. Faith is how you access everything that God did. According to Romans chapter five, verse one and two, it talks about all these things that God did for you in grace. You now access them by faith. Now, I think sometimes we've tried to make faith into a formula and it becomes almost like difficult. I don't think when Jesus was here, faith was difficult. Like, you know, that lady with the issue of blood, you know, she heard about Jesus and she said, if I can touch his garment, I'll be made whole. She got to Jesus, touch his garment, and she was healed. She didn't hear me teach on faith. I don't know. I I could have screwed her up, right? She didn't hear Paul teach on faith. Paul wasn't even saved. He wrote two thirds of the New Testament. Here's what she heard. She heard Jesus was healing and she said, if I can get to him and touch his garment, I'll be made whole. That was her faith message. So sometimes, and, and I try as best I can any, anymore when I'm teaching on something, I try my best not to complicate it or make it something that it really isn't. Because when you do that, people start getting frustrated because it doesn't work in their life. I want to make it practical so this actually works in your life. Right? And so um, a friend of mine teaching on faith, uh, I, I think it's an excellent statement about faith. He said this, Faith is based on two types of knowledge. And this is just review still. Knowledge, number one, as to what is said. So in other words, you got to find out what God said. It's pretty simple. And then I love this. And, and knowledge as to the reliability of the one who said it. I want to ask you a question. Is God reliable? Yes. Right? So I go to the word and I find out things, but then I need to know in my life that there is no one more reliable than God. I'm not, remor- I know some of you might think, oh, pastors, he, he, I am not more reliable than God. I mean, I, I'm not even anywhere close. I'm not even, I'm not even here compared to him. He's the most reliable. So if I can get you to understand, put God's word in your heart and then understand there's no one as reliable as him. 
He'll heal you of whatever you have going on. He'll turn your life around. If you're depressed right now, he can turn you around and get you over into joy. Whatever is going on in your life, if your finances are a wreck, he can find you a job. He can find you a way out. He can get you out of whatever is going on. That's the kind of God that we serve. So tonight, I want to talk to you about this whole idea of how do I release faith? Because faith is in your heart, but it needs to get out. It needs to be released. And James, who is the half-brother of Jesus, the story behind James is this, that while Jesus walked on the earth, James was not a Christian. They say he watched from a distance, but it wasn't until his half-brother Jesus resurrected. And I know if you come from the same background I do, that's mind-boggling that Jesus had family. I, I was raised that he had no family born of a virgin. And then in my mind, I always thought, well, she was a virgin after. It's like, no, <laughs> she had other kids. According to scripture, she, he had brothers and sisters. It's pretty wild. But James was a half-brother because, you know, of course, she, she birthed a son, Jesus, by the Holy Spirit. She had never had a man at that point. So James is a half-brother. James comes to Christ later after he resurrects, and then he writes a book called the Book of James, one of the most practical books that you'll ever read in your life. And I, I don't have time to get into this whole chapter, but in James chapter two, you would do yourself a favor to read it all later and read it out of different translations. It's pretty amazing. But James chapter two, if you want to go there, if, if you have a Bible, James chapter two, if not, you can look on the screen. Um, verse 14, it says this. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith? So we found out how faith comes, right? But he does not have works can faith save him? And now this can confuse you, but before we get any confusion going on, let me tell you what this says in the original translation. It says this, he, it says, if he has faith, but does not have corresponding actions. So this word works here, if you want to write it down, taking notes, literally means corresponding actions. So here's what he's saying. If you say you have faith, you'll have actions to prove it. So, you know, in, this, in, in James, you know, he talks about, well, if you say you have faith and you see a person who's not got everything that they need in life and you just say, bless you, I'll pray for you, and you never do anything for them, what is that saying? That's saying you, now remember the word faith, it means you have this conviction, it's what you believe. But another word for faith is this, and we haven't talked about it, it's persuasion. It's what you're persuaded of or about. Now check this out. If I'm persuaded that God wants me to help other people, but I never help them, then I have faith that is dead. That's, that's what he's saying. He's saying if, if you have this faith that you say you have, and you're persuaded of it, but you never act like you do anything for anyone else, or you never do anything for anyone, then he said you really don't have faith. Your faith is dead. So here's what he's saying. He's saying faith always will have action or corresponding action, which simply means you'll do something. Let's read verse 17. I'm just skipping down for time's sake. Watch what it says. Verse 17. Thus, I'm reading out of New King James. It says, also faith by itself, if it does not have corresponding actions or works, it's dead. Well, in the original language, it doesn't use the word dead. I, I, know, I know it's here and it's fine. It says it's inactive and unproductive. So here's what he's saying. He's saying you can say you have faith, but if you don't have corresponding actions, your faith is inactive. Your faith is unproductive. And that's pretty simple, right? I mean, we, we, would all, we would all know that. But here's the thing about it. When it comes to your life, so, so we're, let's, let's stop thinking about well, man, if I have faith and I, I say I'm a Christian, I'm a Christ follower, I should help other people. And if I'm not, then he says it's inactive. Let's stop, put that aside for a minute. Let's talk about you. What if, what if someone came to you and diagnosed you with something, a doctor, and said, you have this? What does faith do? Faith can stay in your heart and say, I really love Jesus and I really trust him. Or faith can start saying something to the situation that you just were told that you have. So, so, so let, let's watch this. James chapter two, verse 26. Watch this. For as the body without the spirit is dead, inactive, right? You're dead. So faith without corresponding actions is inactive and unproductive. 
So let me, let me just tell you what this is doing. You can't say that that many times without knowing, I want someone to get this. How many times do we have to hear from James that if you have faith, you're going to do something with it? If you have faith, you're going to do something, right? If I say I have faith, I'm going to do something. I'm just not going to say, uh, I, I have faith. No, you're going to have corresponding actions. So let's read something. This is found in Romans because I want to show you how this practically works. So I think the best way for us to understand it is with salvation. So let's see how faith had to have something corresponding action-wise before you ever could be actually saved. Romans chapter 10, verse 8. We'll start there. We'll go down to verse 11. Watch what it says. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Paul was a faith preacher, right? And he says, here's the location. The word needs to be in your mouth and in your heart. Well, what happens when the word is in your mouth and in your heart? Watch what it says. He says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So how does this work? Well, this is how it works. You can have faith supposedly in your heart and say, I really believe in Jesus, but it's all in here. But he said, that's not how it's going to happen. You have to have corresponding actions. You have to believe in your heart and say something with your mouth, or you're not really truly walking with Christ. So in other words, if I'm a Christ follower, this is how it happened. I believed in my heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, and I said something out of my mouth. Now, you remember this. We've talked about it, but I'm going to just remind you. Colossians 2.6, it says, in the same way that you received Christ, now you need to walk in him that way. Well, I received Christ right here. I believed in my heart. I said something with my mouth, and he said, you're saved. Well, if I'm going to walk the rest of my walk that way, I'm going to have to believe something in my heart and say something with my mouth frequently. Are you all with me? I don't know if you've ever, ever gone back and read this or not, but how many remember the story of, um, you know, in, in the Old Testament, there's a story about um, David and Goliath. Anyone remember the story? I mean, we all remember that one. I mean, most people remember it. Even if they weren't church, we were like, yeah, I've heard of that story, right? Have you ever gone back and read it? I don't know if you know this or not, and I did a teaching on it back years ago. I'm not doing this tonight. I called it the war, uh, the war of words. And if you go back and look at the story, Goliath says something to David. David says something back. Goliath says another thing to David. David says something back. It was like a war on these words. And it's exactly a picture of what happens with us in our lives with the enemy. Sometimes the enemy is our own selves. We have to speak to our own selves. And sometimes the enemy from the outside is coming, trying to put thoughts and put things into our life. And if you don't have a war of words with him and you just sit and allow it to happen, you're going to lose. Right? You cannot not say anything. You have to say something. And what I'm trying to encourage you with tonight, what if we put God's word in enough in us that that's what comes out? So that's what comes out towards our situation or whatever. So here's what I want to tell you. And I'm not going to go too crazy on this tonight, but I want to go far enough that you get this. So something's going to come after you trying to say what God says. Something's going to try to get you to stop saying it. Watch this. This is Hebrews on the screen, chapter 10, verse 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope. Now, in the uh, other translations, it says, of our faith. And it's sort of weird that hope is here, but the actual word in the Greek is hope. And this is the way it should read. Let us hold fast to what we're expecting. The word hope is our expectation. He says, let us hold fast to our expectation." Now, listen closely. The word hold fast literally paints a picture of someone holding on to something so tight because someone's trying to pull it off of them. 
And he says, here's what you need to do. You need to hold on to what you say out of your mouth. The word confession, for those that have never heard me teach on this before, it's a pretty cool Greek word. It's the Greek word homo legeo, and it literally means to say what someone else has said. Are you with me? To say what someone else said. He's saying this. When you start saying what God says, someone's going to come and try to get this out of your grip. And he said, you're going to have to hold on to what you're saying or what you're expecting. You're going to have to hold on to it because you and I both know it's bad enough that we just have ourselves to deal with. But the enemy's going to come and world is going to come and they're going to try to grab off of us from saying what God says. So he says this, he says, let us hold fast to the confession or to say what someone else has said of our expectation without wavering for he who promised is faithful. In other words, here's what he's saying. He's saying, if you hold on to it, God will be faithful to do whatever it is that you're saying that he, listen, you're not saying what you want to say. You're saying what God said. There's a whole different thing. If you're just saying mumbo jumbo of what you think ought to happen, that's one thing. If you're saying what God said, it's a whole nother thing. This is what God says about your situation. This is what God says about you. So you start saying what God says, it starts to do something. So check this out. And I know there's a lot of scriptures, but tonight I'm just going to, I'm jumping in it and just going to get into a bunch of these. So just hold on. Second Corinthians 4.13, it says this. And since we have the same spirit of faith, Paul's writing this, according to his written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore we speak. This is Paul writing this. He said, we believe, therefore we speak. He says, then this is what I interpret this as. Then I'm going to have to believe and I'm going to have to speak. But I like the way it's worded. He says, I believe and therefore I spoke. In the original language, it says this. I believe and as a result of that, I speak. So I think this is good. I believe and as a result of what I believe, I begin to say something. Right? I begin to speak. That, Paul's writing this. It's in the New Testament. And then if you skip down to verse 18, listen to what he says. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You say, what? Yeah. He says, for we don't look at the things which are seen. That's what's going on right now in your life. He said, but we look at the things that are not seen. That would be what God says. Right now, what God says might not be the thing you see in your life manifesting, but you're going to have to look at what God said and not look at what's going on. We're going to talk about more about that next week, but listen to this. It says, for the things which are seen are temporary. You know what it says in the original language? They are subject to change. So check this out. The things that are seen right now, right here, the things you're seeing, he says they are subject to change. So whatever is going on right now, no matter what it is, no matter what you're facing, no matter how bad it looks, no matter how bad the marriage is, no matter how bad the finances are, no matter how bad your body feels, the Bible says it's subject to change. And let, let me just say something, because I, I think this happens with faith people. So, you know, in our culture that we live in right now, there's extremes on both sides, right? There are still people that act like no one ever found out yet that eating healthy is important. They act like it's ne that's never happened. And, and I, I think if someone talks about it, they just cover their ears like, I don't even want to hear this. They act like that's never happened, right? But in our culture that we live in right now, people have found out. Actually, he, eating does affect your body, right? So we had a preacher in back years ago. And I, I'm, I'm pretty healthy, and I've been that way for a long time. I take supplements, you know, because I'm like, I, you know, even though as healthy as I eat, I know I don't probably get the right nutrition, so I take supplements on top of it, all this stuff. And this preacher's preaching, and I'm sitting on the front row. It's my church. <laughs> and he's preaching, and he says, these people that take supplements and just went off on supplements. They take this green stuff. It's stupid. While well, I was taking green stuff, and I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, Oh, man, he was just going down. People were like, see, he's reading your mail. No, he wasn't reading any mail. He just, he didn't want to take supplements. So he's telling all of us how we should. It wasn't a word from God. So I just kept on doing what I was doing, you know, and 
I was listening to a friend of mine preach. We've had him here multiple times by the name of Keith Moore. And I thought, ah, that's the way this needs to be put into perspective. He said this. He said, if you take supplements and you put your faith in them as the healer, you're going to be in trouble. But he said, if you take supplements and look at them as a ministry of helps, a helps ministry to your body healing up, put them in the right perspective, and they'll actually help you even more, that they can be a helps ministry, but they are not God. Right? And I thought, that's the answer. Because when this person said it, I was so grieved on the inside, but I thought, I'm not going to get up and say anything about it. I've never said anything. This is the first time I've ever said anything about it, ever. So it happened years ago, years and years ago. And the person that said it's not alive anymore, so should have took his supplements. But anyway, um, I'm just kidding, just kidding. Did, that's not, I, sorry. Lord, forgive me. But anyway, um, so, so here's what I thought. It was interesting. Keith Moore said, he, he ran healing school at Raymond Bible Training Center for years. And he said, people would come in and they always had the newest, this is going to heal me. And it was some kind of new supplement or some kind of new way of eating or whatever. And he said, listen, I'm not against what you're doing, but don't put your faith in that. Put your faith in God and let that be a ministry of helps to your body, not to God. God doesn't need no help. But your body might need a ministry of helps, just like churches need ministry of helps where people help you know, and serve. Your body might need that, but keep it in the right perspective. So here's what I do. Every time I take supplements, every time I do any of that kind of stuff, here's what I do. I always say, Father, I take these by faith, and they are a helps ministry to my body. Why? Because they're not my healer. All they're doing is supplying my body with some natural stuff that I could get from food, but sometimes I'm too lazy to eat it, so I'll just take the supplements. Right? So fine, you know, however you want to do it. But the deal about it is keep it in the right perspective. But check this out. If you put faith in God and faith in your words and you start speaking over the things that you eat and that you take, that when I eat healthy, which I do now all the time, I always say this, Father, I thank you that everything that I eat is a ministry of helps to my body, for my body being strong and my body having the right health and all of that kind of stuff. That's a different mentality than if I eat, all I have to do is eat healthy and then I'll never even need God. No. Like God is number one. He's your healer. He's your helper. He's the one that you need. And then you can look at all of this other stuff and say, that's a helps ministry to me. It's not my healer. So some of you here right now, a doctor has put you on medication. So every time you take your medication, and this is coming right from the mouth of a man who led healing school for years. He said, every time you take your medication, do not throw it away. Every time you take it, you just say, I believe this is a helps ministry to my body. And I believe that someday my doctor will tell me I don't have to be it on anymore because my doctor will just say, man, your body's healed up. You don't even need to be on this. That's a different way of looking at it versus I have to take this medicine. And then I've had people tell me this, and I, 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 I think it's amazing. They said, I would take this medicine, and I used to say this every time I take it. This stuff doesn't work. This is stupid. And they said, it never worked. They said, my, my, it never helped. It never changed. It never did a thing. And then they said, I realized that hearing you teach one time that I'm not going to put my faith in that, but I'm going to believe God that when I do take it, it's a minist like a ministry of help is helping me. And all of a sudden, it changed. So change what you're saying, even if you're taking natural medicine, just change what you're saying and about what you're saying over your body. Let me, let me just, I'm going to read a couple more things. Y'all ready? Um, if, if, if the screen folks will just go down to Genesis 28, I want to just show you something real quick. I know, I know you might have never heard this before. This might be mind boggling to you tonight, but it's very interesting. Genesis chapter 28, verse 12, it says this, Jacob, and he dreamed a dream, Jacob, there was a ladder set up on the earth and at the top of it reached to heaven. So the ladder reached from earth to heaven. He's in a dream. And angels of God were ascending and descending on that ladder. Pretty amazing. Here's what's really amazing. Ladder in the Hebrew, according to scholars, the numeric value of this word in the Hebrew language and the New Testament, it translates over to voice or words. And this is the way it could read. He dreamed a dream, and on this ladder, 
he saw, it was set up, you know, went up to heaven, came down to earth, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on words. The angels of God were ascending and descending on words. Now, I, I, let, me, let me just say this real quick. Every person in this room has angelic activity that God has set up to be around your life. Angels. Now, I know this is crazy, and I know you probably, you probably think, that's crazy. Angels are not to be prayed to. You don't pray to, you know, people have told me before, I pray to my angels. Like, well, what? what? The only person you pray to, you don't pray to even Jesus. You pray to God in Jesus' name. The Bible says to the Father in Jesus' name is how you'll pray in this day. Jesus said it. You're not praying to Jesus. You're not praying to the Holy Spirit. You're not praying to angels. Dear angel, follow me around today. No. But what you are allowed to do is demand or say to angels, this is what I want you to do. You're not praying to him. So, so I know, I, this is crazy. My spiritual father told a story about one time where he had a vision. And in the vision, see, the, we see visions here and we're like, yeah, that's awesome. But if you say a person had one, people are like, oh my God, that's crazy, right? But he had a vision. And in the vision, the Lord told him, if you'll start commanding your angels to go out and bring in things that I've planned for your life, they'll start bringing stuff to you. So he said, I started just saying, angels, go out and bring in my finances that I need in my life or bring in the money. He was a minister, so he needed a certain amount of money to run his ministry. And he said, all of a sudden, stuff would start coming in from avenues they never saw it before. So angels move on your words. Let me ask you this. This is a great thought. So this is what he said one time. He said, what are your angels hearing you say? Are you utilizing them or are you making them run from you? Think about that. I want angel activity to be real, right? I mean, right now in the culture we live in, there's movies about it constantly. People love this whole angel deal. This is in the Bible. This, is, this was in here way before they made a movie about angels. Angels are there to protect you. I believe everybody has angels that will protect them. I've had people come to me before and they'll say, man, I was in a terrible car accident. I don't know why God didn't do anything. I'm like, you're still breathing, so I think something happened. There could have been an angel that stopped everything for you. You could have been dead. So don't always look at it from that negative side of why didn't God, but always look at it as, man, thank God that he did something for me. So your words become important. So before we close this up tonight, I want you to write something down. It's a, it's a mighty powerful um, um, this, this is a quote, and it's from E.W. Kenyon, who was a great man of God, who's a Baptist minister, but got a revelation of how, how important the word was. He said this, confession or your words, it builds the road over which faith carries its mighty cargo. I want you to write this down. Confession builds the road or your words builds the road over which faith carries its mighty cargo. So in other words, you've got to look at it like this. And I know this is written back years ago. So, you know, different, different way. Today it might have been written in a different way. But listen to this, guys. Every time you speak words, faith is riding on those words. And it's moving spiritual cargo from one place to another. Because listen, there's an unseen realm, whether you believe it or not. And in the unseen realm is everything you need. God wants you to take what's in this unseen realm and bring it into this realm. It doesn't come any other way except by faith, by words that you speak. They bring the cargo to you. So I want to close with two scriptures. Yeah, I mean, I know it's crazy and I know it's like, man, I've never heard any teaching like this. We've been teaching this for years. So it's just the most, in, in my viewpoint, one of the most basic things. But faith has to have action, and the action that it's going to have to be released is your words. Are y'all out there? It's not always you just making a movement. People say, I got I to, in order to have a corresponding action, I got to make a move. No, it's your words, more important than anything else. You can have an action, there's no doubt about it, but your words coming out of your mouth carry the cargo that faith is going to bring from this unseen realm into this realm. Are, are y'all with me? All right. Let me give you two scriptures and we're going to close. 
I just want you to see this. Isaiah 55, 11, and this is out of the Amplified Bible. It says this, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. This is God speaking. It says this, it shall not return to me void without producing any effect or useless, but it shall accomplish that which I please and it will prosper and it, sh it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. So watch what he's saying. He's saying, I'm, when I speak words, he said, my words never return to me void. They always accomplish what I send them forth to do. Now, what if we hooked our words up with his word? What if, what if I hook up my words with his words? Jesus said it this way. In John 15, 7, it's not on the screen. Jesus said this, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you ask whatever you will and it shall be done. Now, Jesus is either a liar, he's either a liar or he's crazy. Now, listen to what he said again. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you ask whatever you will and I'm gonna do it for you. Jesus said that. I didn't say it. I'm just telling you what it says. But Jesus said in John 15, 7, you abide in me. My words abide in you. So in other words, he's saying, man, the most important thing is you abiding. You're having this fellowship with God and with Jesus. Let his word abide in you. He said, you ask whatever you will. Guess what that is? That's saying something. He said, when you ask, he said, I'll do whatever it is that you say. So check this out. This is Jeremiah. Now I'm reading some of these from Old Testament just because they're great scriptures. Jeremiah 1, 12, and we'll close. It says this, then said the Lord to me, you have seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. I want to say it one more time. Listen, God said, and Jeremiah's writing this down. He said, then you said, Lord, to me, you have seen well, for I am alert and active, watching over my word to perform it. God watches over his word to perform it. So here's something you might want to check up. If you see no results or you see negative results going on in your life, check out what you're saying. That's, it's as simple as it is. We make it really hard sometimes. And it's like, no, this is not, it's not rocket science. This is really easy. Put God's word in, God's word comes out. Keep listening to God's word. It's sort of like fuel, right? If you go to the gas station, you know, now today, pumps shut off, right? If, if, a pump, if you're pumping gas and it comes all the way and it's full, it shuts off, right? Back in the day when all of some of us that are older, when we were growing up, you keep on pumping gas and you're not looking, you had a phone in your hand or something. We didn't have any, but I'm, I'm just saying you, mine was ADD. I just wasn't paying attention. It's like, oh my God, gas is pouring out. Thank God it was a quarter, a gallon, right? The more you put God's word into your ears, eventually it's going to do the same thing as in a gas tank. If you keep on putting it in, it's going to come out. Are y'all out there? So if you keep on putting God's word in your ears, it's going to come out of your mouth. What happens then? God says here, I'll watch over my word to perform it. I'll watch over my word to cause whatever it is my word says to happen. I'll do whatever my word says. That's what he's saying here. I'm watching over my word and I'm going to perform whatever my word says. He's saying, listen, if you're a Christ follower and the Old Testament knew it doesn't matter if you are a Christ follower and you have Christ in you, if you keep on saying what he said and you keep on speaking God's word into your circumstance, then God is going to perform what he said that he will perform. Are you all with me? So how do, I, how do I release my faith? I release my faith by believing in my heart and then I start saying stuff. And how do I release it into my situation? How do I get faith released into my situation? I start speaking to my situation what God said about my situation. See, some of you have allowed your, your problems, your, maybe, maybe a person hurt you, right? So you are allowing your life to be affected by that instead of started, starting to say what God says. Forget what they did. Start getting your focus back on God and start saying what God says about your life, about your situation, about your marriage, about your children, about whatever. Start saying what God says. Now, in closing, because next week, I, I mean, don't, do not miss next week on, on this subject that we're going to talk about. Um, next week, we're going to look more about this whole idea 
that whatever you are seeing right now, because he said everything is temporary, right? He said it's subject to change. We're going to we're gonna, we're gonna go into not necessarily that verse, but look at that whole idea next week when we get into this. Guys, everything you're looking at right now is subject to change. Everything that's going on right now, your money situation, subject to change. Your job situation, subject to change. Your marriage situation, subject to change. Your kids, subject to change. And what does that mean? That means it doesn't have to stay the way it currently is. Putting God's word into that situation can change that situation. Amen? We have a passion at Faith Family Church to discover all that God has for us. We welcome and honor our guests so you can experience a church that is full of life and encounter a God that's real and loves you. Our worship experiences are designed for every age, helping you to live out a personal relationship with Jesus and develop an authentic faith in Him. We want to redefine church as you might know it, and we're reaching people around the world through our live stream. So we encourage you to join us live online every Sunday at 10 a.m. and Wednesdays at 7 p.m. Because Faith Family Church is for families, for singles, for couples, for the elderly, for young people, for the hurting, the lost, the hopeless. Faith Family Church is for people.